Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. In this video, we're going to take a look at how the current high-speed rail plan came to be, how that might have been done differently with the benefit of hindsight, and how that might help other high-speed rail corridors as we apply these ideas to them in subsequent videos. As discussed in my case for high-speed rail video, things mostly got their start in 1992 when the Federal Railroad Administration created five high-speed rail corridors. Among those five was the California Corridor intended to link San Diego, Los Angeles, and the Bay Area. Since then, there have been a series of studies in California, mostly cumulative, to determine the answer. In 1993, the state legislature created the Intercity High-Speed Rail Commission to study options along the entire route from San Diego to the Bay Area. In 1996, the Intercity High-Speed Rail Commission released a report on its findings. The commission preferred to take an inland route from Los Angeles to San Diego, and this has stuck. If California High-Speed Rail Phase 2 ever gets built, the basic route between the two areas would likely follow the route suggested in the 1996 report. The two main options for getting between Los Angeles and the Bay Area by rail are the coastal route and via the Central Valley. The 1996 commission rejected the coastal route, and the Central Valley has been the route of choice since. These were good decisions based on the difficulty that the coast presents to any construction and land acquisition in California. In 1994, Caltrans did a study on how to connect Los Angeles and Central Valley Transit. This narrowed paths between those areas to two options along Interstate 5, commonly known as the Grapevine, and through Antelope Valley via Soledad Canyon. This is referred in subsequent literature as the Southern Mountain Crossing. We then need to get out of the Central Valley and back over the mountains into the Bay Area. This is referred to as the Northern Mountain Crossing, and there are several possible routes. The 1996 Commission narrowed the candidates in this regard to Pinoche, Pacheco, and Altamont Passes. The 1996 Commission concluded the best route overall was inland between San Diego and Los Angeles, through the Antelope Valley from Los Angeles to the Central Valley, along the eastern side of the Central Valley, roughly paralleling State Route 99, intersecting the various communities there from Bakersfield all the way through Modesto, and then over the Altamont Pass and through the Bay Area. This conclusion is based on a phased implementation with two phases. Those phases roughly are equivalent to the current setup shown here. The 1996 Commission's conclusions about Phase 1 are based on Phase 1's benefit to the entire system upon completion. Time to complete was not considered to be a big enough factor to mention because they concluded the entire project could be built in 8 years. I think the better way to do this is to get things running as soon as possible, get something writable in place and press for expansion. Create momentum that carries the idea through. Ironically, California High Speed Rail is doing this now, only in the wrong place. However, each phase should be its own benefit in pursuit of the whole system, which would be of greatest benefit. The benefit of the planned Merced-Bakersfield portion is small compared to other sections that could have been completed for the same $30 billion. Lesson number one, start with something you can actually accomplish. California High Speed Rail is the largest public works project in American history, aside from the interstate highway system. Maybe we bit off a little more than we can chew. The 1996 commission cannot be faulted for not foreseeing funding issues crippling the pace of construction. The commission recommended a five cent gas tax, which would have generated 770 million a year. They alternately proposed a one quarter percent state sales tax that would have generated the same amount and better accounted for inflation. But then again, they thought the uh, thing would be done in eight years, so no need to worry about inflation. A gas tax instituted in 2000 would have generated $11.5 billion for the project by 2015 when they started construction. In addition, this would have avoided all of the trouble generated by stipulations on the bond and the roughly $4 billion that came in from the federal government around 2009. In 2005, the California High Speed Rail Authority put out a 1,000-page environmental impact report for California High Speed Rail as a whole system. This is different than the much more detailed uh, environmental impact reports that are required for each segment. However, this report is far more detailed in route analysis than the 1996 commission. 
Nevertheless, the two reports largely concur aside from the Northern Mountain Pass solution. The 1996 commission picks Altamont Pass. The 2005 report favors Pacheco Pass and a couple of new options about 15 miles north of there. This all culminated in the 2008 business plan and the 2008 ballot measure Proposition 1A. The business plan goes with Pacheco Pass as the Northern Mountain Crossing. The cost for phase one of the project was estimated to be around $33 billion. It was estimated half of that would need to come from the federal government. About a quarter was expected to come from local and private sources. The rest would be covered by the $9 billion Prop 1A bond. At that time, there was no regular and continuing funding source. Speaking of Prop 1A, it has three major flaws. Number one, it requires that the train have a maximum service speed of at least 200 miles per hour. This unnecessarily reduces flexibility in train set choice and dictates that portions of the route must be engineered for 200 mile per hour service. Number two, it sets minimum time between stations and those require the train to be very fast over most distances. The best example is that the train must be able to travel between Los Angeles and San Francisco in two hours and 40 minutes or less. Given the preferred route, this would necessitate an average speed of 176 miles per hour or faster, requiring this to be one of the fastest passenger routes in the world, despite 10% of the route being through mountain tunnels and another 25% being on mostly at grade shared track through urban and suburban areas. Number three, it dictates that no more than 50% of funding for a given section can come from the bond. This hamstrings the project when other funding isn't available or it puts the project at the mercy of entities providing funding that the authority is desperate for, like the federal money that showed up in 2009 and 2010. This combination required the project start construction in the Central Valley because the federal government favored it. Due to time restrictions placed on those funds, the authority was strongly influenced to start construction before they were ready, which ultimately led all of those contracts to triple in cost as subsequent boards struggled to unravel the damage. There are other conditions and restrictions in Prop 1A that lead to inflexibility and rising cost. The main lessons here are lesson number two, don't constrain the project too tightly legally, allow designers and builders some flexibility. Designers and builders design and build better than politicians and bureaucrats. And lesson number three, don't demand the project be built in an expensive manner and then expect the cost to be reasonable. They should have built way more risk contingency into the project given what they were tasked to design and build. And lesson number four, don't hinge the project itself on a public vote. You'd be lucky if 10,000 people in California are qualified to decide if a project like this is a good idea. Legislatures should legislate, not the general public. While we're on the subject of funding problems, the assumed local and private funding of the 2008 business plan never materialized and so far the project has only gotten about $4 billion out of the anticipated $12 to $16 billion from the federal government. As a result, the legislature had to scramble to find a funding source and in 2014 ended up allocating 25% of state cap and trade receipts to the project through 2030. The problem is that these funds are not consistent. In 2022, these funds amounted to $961 million, but that total was only $410 million in 2020. Still, this source amounts to about half of the project's identified revenue. Since the 2008 business plan, the cost of the project's first phase has exploded from $33 billion to $106 billion with a funding plan that's still geared toward that $33 billion amount. This is lesson number five, identify and implement reliable and steady base funding before construction starts. Do not assume funding will come from any source that hasn't committed itself. You don't need to identify all funds to start a project this large, but you do need a source to keep things going at a reasonable clip that can stay ahead of inflation if there are delays. Construction started on California High Speed Rail in 2015 in the Central Valley mainly because the project was starved for funds and the federal government put conditions on the roughly $4 billion they gave to the project in 2009 and 2010. Construction was started in places where they didn't own enough land to do necessary work and it was a mess. 
The cost of the initial 119 mile portion has tripled, largely due to bungling by the authority between 2015 and 2017. This is lesson number six, get your ducks in a row before starting construction. This one is obvious and most sources are surprised that the authority did what it did from about 2010 through 2017. The severe mismanagement led to a state audit, a shuffling of authority personnel, and subsequent reform in authority oversight. Now let us undo those mistakes and explore some theoretical ways this might have happened differently with the first six lessons learned. I'm going to look at two scenarios. Number one is let's build what is currently planned but in a slightly different order. Number two is let's build a direct route from Los Angeles to San Francisco first and then worry about the rest. Phase one of scenario number one, we're going to build from San Francisco to Gilroy. We're also going to build from Anaheim to Burbank. When these are done, we're going to have trains running on both of them. These sections will cost 11 billion and 6 billion respectively. Add in other expenses like train sets for a total of 21 billion to get things operating. This cost is year of expense on an assumption of completion in 2034. This is more than it would cost if it were started 20 years ago, but I'm keeping it expensive because I want to build it better. $21 billion is within the amount of revenue allocated to the current project through 2025. If you decide to stop here, you got yourself a couple of 110 to 125 mile per hour commuter lines through the most populous areas of the state. If it is decided to continue, the public will be motivated to properly fund the project in subsequent phases. Phase two of scenario number one. In the north, we're going to extend from Gilroy through Merced, Modesto, and Stockton to Sacramento. It's $15 billion to get under Pacheco Pass and across to the east end of the Central Valley. From there, we can get to Sacramento for about another $15 billion, so $30 billion to extend from Gilroy to Sacramento. In the south, we're going to extend from LA Union Station to San Diego. The best cost estimate for this section is from the 1996 Commission Report, which projected this portion would cost about 50% as much as Phase 1, or roughly $50 billion. When this is done, we're at a $95 billion total, and we have connected metro areas of about 32 million people in two different systems. We also run into another opportunity to decide if we'd like to stop or continue. Another $15 billion will get you into Bakersfield from Merced. To connect the whole thing via an LA to Bakersfield section, you're looking at $35 billion. The overall idea is not that different than what they're trying to do currently, but the number of people potentially served early is vastly different. Now let's look at scenario number two. We're chucking the current plan and going straight between Los Angeles Union Station and San Francisco at 4th and King. We're going up the grapevine instead of detouring through the Antelope Valley, roughly same cost, just shorter up Interstate 5. We're going over the northern mountain crossing at Pinoche Pass, as this is the most direct route. These changes cut the route distance from 470 miles to about 370. We're going to run at a more reasonable and realistic rate in service of 155 miles per hour on average, to keep costs down on any additional tunneling or necessary curves. We'll get there in two hours, 24 minutes. We're going to finish 25% faster because there is 25% less to build. We're going to save $35 billion by cutting the fat off the ends, deferring construction of 10 stations, avoiding two years of inflation on the first part and not bungling the Central Valley. Final cost, $70 billion and done roughly eight years quicker. That's trains running between Los Angeles and San Francisco by 2032, connecting roughly 16 million people. Want to expand it from that point? Have at it. You have some extra expense not found in the current plan because you'll want to get to the east side of the Central Valley via the Altamont Corridor, but other than that, the cost is similar. Call this system about $5 billion more expensive overall, even with the two mountain crossings in the north, which will improve service to the Bay and service times between the Bay and Modesto stocked in Sacramento. The only thing lost is service to Antelope Valley, which has a suburban and rural population of about 400,000 spread out over 2,000 square miles. But 
You can then service the Santa Clarita area if you like, which is roughly the same population, but about 30 times more dense. Compared to the way things are going, that right there sounds pretty good to me. Lesson number seven, your system being unable to carry one single passenger for decades will not help your case. That brings us to the present. California High-Speed Rail is underfunded to the tune of $100 billion. The authority is hoping to finish a 170-mile operating segment between Merced and Bakersfield in the Central Valley, linking approximately 2.5 million people out of California's 39 million population. There is no identified funding beyond 2030, and the authority is left to hope that the federal government will bail the project out. Let this be a lesson for other high-speed rail corridors that haven't started their projects in earnest. It doesn't have to be this way with other projects attempting to build moderately modern and fast trains. This was the first of 11 videos looking at the 10 Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridors and the defunct Florida corridor now partially utilized by Brightline, so plenty more to come. The next video is going to be Stu's high-speed rail news for May 2023, so keep an eye out for that. If you have any opinions about the subject of this video or just faster trains in general, please share them in the comments. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.